Welcome everyone uh, to this webinar. I'm Jason Gerson, a Senior Program Officer at uh, PCORI, or the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which is a funder of clinical comparative effectiveness research. Um, I co-chair the HRA Open Science Task Force, and some of the goals of the task force include uh, learning about current practices and policies regarding data sharing, pre-registration, and registered reports, among other uh, issues, uh, among funders and other parts of the research ecosystem. Um, I, we also work to identify and disseminate um, information about best practices on open science and stimulate discussion among funders, funders about future directions and aspirations for open science. So today's webinar is our second in a series about pre-registration. This follows up on a webinar um, that was held in December 2018. So without any further delay, I'll briefly introduce our two speakers. Uh, Dr. David Meller is the Director of Policy Initiatives at the Center for Open Science and supervises the implementation of open science policies, including data citation, data and code sharing, uh, pre-registration, replication, and registered reports. And Dr. Savrula Kusta is the Chief Editor of Nature Human Behavior, where she's implemented the registered reports format and has over a decade of experience in implementing high standards of research at plot biology and trends in cognitive sciences. Um, so I'll first turn it over to David. David, please go ahead. Um, one more housekeeping note I wanted to say. Um, all attendees should be able to use the, the chat window if you wanna provide a comment. There's also a, a specific Q&A feature um, if, if you have a very specific question you wanna make sure it gets answered. So please use those. We'll um, be monitoring those and, um, and, and make sure anything that comes through there eventually gets answered, at least by the end. All right, so this is the, the first half. I'll be talking for about 20 or 25 minutes um, about sort of a general overview of registered reports and how they can be relevant to the research funders community. Um, Severula at Nature Human Behavior will be talking more specifically about what they've um, been seeing there, what, what types of submissions, what types of response that has um, happened so far with the implementation there. You can um, find this presentation at that URL. These materials will be made available to everyone attending and everyone who's invited. So if you want to use or reuse any of this material, please feel free to do so. Um, so first I'm gonna give a, a very basic introduction to what, to what the Center for Open Science is, just so you know who we are um, and um, where we, the types of fields we work in, followed by a general overview, just give the basic mechanics of what a rich report is, give some information um, and distinctions between how registered reports relate to pre-registrations because they are very similar but have a couple of distinct features. Um, talk about some of the advantages that the registered report format has to individual authors and researchers and the scientific community, but also the benefits it has to the scientific community as, as a whole. A um, couple of pointers about how um, research funders can use the format in their workflow. Um, and cover a couple of um, FAQs that we see pop up. Um, and then I'll have it handed over to Stavrula. So our mission at the Center for Open Science is to increase openness, integrity, and the reproducibility of scientific research. And we do that through three major activities. We, um, we're well known for a lot of the meta science work we do where these are the reproducibility projects um, where we attempt to um, replicate work that had been previously published. And the purpose of that is to sort of identify barriers um, to successful replications. Those barriers that we identify are then used to inform our policy and our advocacy and our um, education initiatives to help increase reproducibility through increased transparency. Um, and finally, most of the folks who work for us at the Center for Open Science are developers who build um, infrastructure, infrastructure solutions um, to enable the actions for which we advocate. So when we um, talk about increased collaboration, data sharing, or pre-registration, we build tools to enable all three of those activities. Um, and we're funded by a diverse range of government and um, private foundations um, who support our work in various means. So when judging a scientific study, or any scientific claim really, um, there are three main 
ways that that can happen. You can look at the importance of the research question. You can look at the rigor of the methods that were used to conduct that study. Um, and then finally, you can look at the, the sort of the credibility of the results. Ideally, the results need to flow directly from what was proposed in the questions and the methods. Um, but but in, re in reality, we know that the, the results are what matters most for publishing and career advancement. So if we have a general premise that hypothesis testing research is given a particular value, that value is provided by the, the importance of those research questions, those first two things, the rigor of the methods, and not um, the results it produces. The value of the hypothesis testing framework is given by the first two. So if we accept this as a premise, then it's important to make as many decisions as possible before we see the results of the, the outcome of the study. And that's the rationale behind the register report publishing format. It's a two-stage peer review process where the, much of the peer review occurs before the study con uh, is conducted. So there are many advantages to that for both improving the study design and sort of addressing a lot of the biases that can occur as results become known. That first stage of peer review uh, typically looks like, uh, can look like a typical research article formatted with the introduction, proposed methods and analyses, um, and possibly pilot data. Um, and then it's obviously going to exclude results and discussion. That gets submitted to a journal and the reviewers and the editors are evaluating whether or not the hypotheses are, are justified, either theoretically justified or the hypotheses could be directly of, you know, um, um, replicating the hypotheses that were proposed in an earlier study. Are the proposed methods and analyses feasible and, and um, sufficiently detailed? So can, if you're describing a recipe there, is it specific enough for somebody else to follow? Is the study well powered? Typically over 90%, although some journals, um, Nature Human Behavior being one of them, what can um, have um, specific power requirements. And have the authors included sufficient positive controls to confirm that the study will provide a fair test. This is an important point that we'll come back to, but it um, uh, puts the reviewers in a frame of mind, not knowing what the results look like, how can we be sure that the study is gonna be conducted in a very competent manner? If the answer to all those questions is yes, then the journal um, has the option of providing uh, in-principle acceptance, IPA. I'll use that term uh, several times throughout this webinar. Um, and that's a promise given by, this, by the journal to publish the resulting work regardless of the outcome, of the main outcome of the study. The work is conducted, sent back to the authors with that in-principle acceptance. Um, after the work is completed and written up, authors submit a stage two that from results section uh, uh, for peer review. That will include both the introduction and methods, which had been um, previously provided to them. New results section, these are all the registered confirmatory findings that were conducted, and they are encouraged to include any other additional exploratory findings that they want to, as long as they're clearly indicated as such. And then, obviously, a discussion talking about the implication of those findings. Um, those last two parts of the study are obviously brand new, had it been reviewed before. Um, and many journals implementing this feature will also require data and materials deposition, um, but that's on a case-by-case -case basis for the journal. Seeing that second submission, the reviewers will evaluate whether or not the positive controls succeeded, are the conclusions being drawn justified by the data, um, and they're explicitly told to, to ignore whether or not the hypotheses were supported, whether they were significant or novel or impactful. These things can't come up at that second stage of review. Um, it's perfectly appropriate at the first stage of review to wonder, will these results be important enough, no matter how they come out, to warrant publication in this journal? But those considerations cannot come up at that second stage of peer review. One question, pre-registration was the subject of the first webinar in this series. Um, and we've had a, a number of education campaigns um, working with researchers who are pre-registering their analyses. But I just wanted to give a little bit of a disambiguation about how pre-registration is distinct from this process because it's one of the um, frequent areas where there's um, a lot of discussion. 
So a pre-registration is a result is a research plan that has a timestamp to it. It's a, it's a read-only version of the research plan that's um, immutable and, and, and itself cannot be changed. It can, of course, be updated as time goes on, but that read-only version is, is a stuck version. It's created before the study, um, and it's submitted to a public registry. There's a couple of nuances for both of those. There are ways to pre-register if you're blind to existing data, if the data already exists but you haven't looked at it. And those public registries, some of which um, also allow an embargo feature. So it does eventually have to become a public, but not necessarily right away. The research plan will contain um, hypotheses, data collection procedures, any variables that are collected or extracted from an existing data set. And the analysis plan will include the specific um, statistical models used to address each of those hypotheses and any criteria used that are going to be used to make an inference. Um, and those are most often p-value thresholds, but also, of course, Bayes factors or confidence interval criteria. Clinical research, economic psychology, and social sciences all use slightly different terminology. Um, and these aren't perfect synonyms, but for the um, sake of early conversation, it's um, fair enough to describe all of these as being functionally the same thing. A pre-registration, um, is typically referred to as simply a registered trial in the clinical world, or perhaps more specifically, a prospective trial registration. Um, and particularly in some of the social sciences and economics, um, the, the term that's used most frequently is a pre-analysis plan that can be attached to a study's registration. So if you hear these terms, in many ways they are synonymous. Both pre-registration and nurture reports have a variety of benefits and, um, and they address similar issues. Pre-registrations and registered reports both address unreported flexibility in conducting um, statistical analyses. So if you've seen some of our background work on um, the importance of addressing those, the take home message for, those unreport for that unreported flexibility is that given a single data set, given a single research question, there are dozens if not hundreds of ways to analyze that. And by chance alone, one, one or more or several will be statistically significant, um, even if um, just by chance alone, because of the number of different analyses that are conducted and the, the expectation that um, um, p-values provide. Both registered reports and pre-registrations make a clear distinction between planned research, that's the confirmatory research that's being conducted to address a very specific predetermined um, research question and unplanned discovery research, the purpose of which is to look for something or discover something that's completely unexpected. And making a clear distinction between those two modes of research is important for reasons I'll, get, I'll reinforce in a moment. Register reports address publication bias against null results. Obviously, if you pre-register your research and, and you have um, Null findings, it could still say, take some work to um, find an outlet for that. Registered reports include a two-stage peer review process where the methods can be improved prior to conducting the study. And that's one of the primary benefits we see with the registered reports format, is that these pre-registrations or these research plans, um, just like any plan or any piece of writing, can be improved through um, additional feedback and review. Confirmatory versus exploratory analysis is a core concept when discussing pre-registration and registered reports. So when you're in the context of confirmation, this confirmation, this is the very traditional hypothesis testing research. Results from this are held to very high standards of, um, there's a very specific way that they should be conducted so that they're held to high standards of rigor. And you do want to minimize false positives when you're in this context of confirmation. Um, and importantly, p-values mean what they were sort of designed to meant the probability of obtaining the observed data in a universe in which the null hypothesis is true or seeing a data set that's even more extreme. Um, that definition is, is a mouthful and doesn't quite um, gel with the way we think all the times. Um, and that's why some of these methods are appropriate to make sure it's a very clear distinction um, when you're in that mode of research. When you're in discovery research, pushing knowledge into new areas, 
the, the, the result of discovery research is a, is a testable hypothesis that can be confirmed, um, a model that can be applied, a theory that can help explain um, a wide range of ph phenomena and then be further tested and refined. And you really do want to minimize false negatives in this mode of research. You don't want to miss out on the next great discovery. You don't want to pass up um, discovering penicillin or, or anything else um, by happenstance. Um, but the results of this are not inferential work that can be applied to wider populations. The result of this is something that deserves to be confirmed. Um, and pre-registration is just a way to make that distinction between these two modes of work a little bit more clear. Um, and I should also sort of reiterate and, and state very clearly that neither of these two modes of research are superior to the other. Um, and we shouldn't impose one on top of the other, or say that one is better than the other, but they are very distinct. Um, and problems arise when the work that was conducted in an exploratory manner is, is presented using the tools that were designed for confirmatory research. Um, that can make the work seem more surprising, um, but it can come at the expense of their ultimate um, later credibility. So there are many advantages of registry reports for the research community. They produce reproducible, highly detailed methods. You're not gonna give an in-principle acceptance. A reviewer is not going to um, see that as being worth publishing regardless of outcome, unless those methods are, are sufficiently precise. They're transparent. They often include um, open research data or materials, and they have a clear distinction between those two modes of research. Um, and, and addresses hindsight bias or publication bias or selective reporting. Um, and so these are all aspects of the registered reports that the research community um, sees as a benefit. Individuals, individual researchers see benefits as well. The early peer review process um, is tremendously beneficial because it provides feedback at a point in time in the research life cycle when that feedback can actually make a difference. And one of the most frustrating things in the world is getting a review back, pointing out a, a serious flaw and saying, you know, oh shucks, you know, if only I had known that a year ago, I would have saved all this time. Um, and so that's a tremendous review to the individual author and to the individual study. It's more efficient overall. Shopping an article around can um, be a waste of both author and reviewer time. That time um, spent upfront on the register report early submission does add additional time to the, to the process, but it's more than made it for in the end. Um, and then it's obviously just simply more ideal. It's focused on what scientists really sort of um, go into the profession caring about. Um, you know, these are the research questions that I, I wanna answer. These are the methods to propose them. Um, those are the things that authors have control over um, and should be rewarded for more and more. And so it's a more ideal way to go about the process. There are a couple of ways that research funders and can engage with the rich reports format. Option one is actually going to be the uh, subject of a um, the third in this series of, of webinars where there's a specific partnership between a journal and a research funder um, where proposals can be jointly evaluated through a shared reviewer pool. Um, and if the um, program officer and the editor jointly both agree on providing funding and in principle acceptance, that work can go forward. There are a number of these partnerships ongoing. There are about four or five of them right now um, between a number of, um, between another number of entities. We'll go into more detail about that again in the next webinar. Option two, um, that a funder can engage with the rich to report format is simply having a requirement that now that the work has been funded, part of this work has to be submitted as an RR, as a registered report. That's obviously going to um, vary tremendously based on the scope of the individual work. If the pro oh, project being awarded is for an, one individual study, this could work very well. Um, even if it ends up getting rejected, that feedback um, provided through the peer review process can help um, improve the statistical analysis plan. And if it is accepted, then of course the funder is guaranteed, you know, um, benefits from knowing precisely where the, the work is going to be published. If the project is, spans many, many years and is likely to include many, many studies, 
Um, obviously, requiring all of that upfront to be a registered report could be impossible. You, you aren't necessarily going to be able to pre-register work that's not going to con be conducted for, for months or years in advance. Um, and so it could be a simpler requirement that some of the work, or perhaps after stage one, or perhaps after a certain amount of time, at least some of the work can be submitted as a register report. So there are a couple of options, even within that option two. And then finally, um, sort of the easiest to implement way to engage with the register report model by the research funders community is to simply incentivize it. So mention to some to grant applicants that the work is going to be either scored or partially evaluated based on plans to pre-register the studies or perhaps to submit it as a registered report. So these are just um, a little bit more creative ways to think about how to engage with the register report format as a research funder. Um, so as I said, so that for option two, um, requiring that research submission, there'll be, um, the register report will get off to a great start. Um, oftentimes those register reports are submitted after a bit of pilot data have been collected. Um, so that can show either preliminary evidence or exciting new evidence, or also just feasibility that a study design is um, um, you know, able to be conducted. A key consideration if you're going with that option too, is to make sure that there's, um, that you encourage time in the, in the project timeline for this. It does take additional time on the front end. There is a, a round or two or perhaps three of peer review that occurs um, early on in that um, study planning process. That's, that's a feature of the registered report publishing format. Um, so adding in that additional amount of time, a couple of months in the project timeline early on um, will have benefits later on, but it is worth considering and, and making sure to at least allow for it. Um, or if you're more directly engaged with the um, grant submission process, perhaps you'll require, make sure to add a, a couple of additional months in your project timeline to account for this process that we want to encourage you to do. Virtual reports have been adopted by, I think that number is even out of date now, I think it's about 166 at the moment. Um, and it's been, they've been adopted by um, journals across the research life cycle or across the, the spectrum of science that's conducted um, in, in biomedicine and social sciences and, and physical sciences. There are a couple of journals doing it even in there. Um, we've seen both the number of journals accepting uh, registered reports and the number of registered reports being published as growing nearly exponentially since over the past five years as this um, initiative has, has grown. Um, and we have resources for both the number of journals and the number of completed registered reports. Um, again, these links will be provided to attendees afterwards. The very first analysis um, that's occurred um, shows some preliminary evidence that they are working as intended. Um, so this was a study late last year that um, preliminary results from that showed um, that, that some of the outcome measures are as expected, um, showing more null results um, from the reported findings than a comparison group of studies. We have a information hub available for editors, for funders, or for authors who are interested in submitting a registered report um, at the website cos.io slash rr for registered report. So there's information there um, that gives clarity into all the different policy options available for journals or funders to choose, um, sort of a detailed explanation of the workflow. Um, detailed language for both editors, reviewers, and authors to use, and template recommendations for how authors should engage with the format. A couple of the FAQs that we often see, if accepting papers before the results exist, how can we know that the studies will be conducted to a high standard? That stage one review criteria often focuses just on that very specific question. If we don't know the results, how can we make sure that it's going to be conducted to a high standard? That creative thinking is often applied by the reviewer and by the editor to push back on the author saying, you know, it, the onus is on you to prove that. And so that comes back to positive controls, checks for floor or ceiling effects um, in the data that are coming in. 
Um, and, and importantly, the journal is not obligated to publish research that does not pass any of the predefined quality checks. If, if errors were made in the system, they're not obligated to publish the work um, if, it's, if it's not meaningful in that way. Um, obviously, the main outcome of the study can't be a blocker to final publication, um, but there can be a series of checks put in place earlier on in the process to ensure that the work is being conducted or that the data are being collected in a, in a way that's expected. What happens if authors need to change something about their procedures after they are provisionally accepted? No well-made plan survives first contact with the enemy, as we know. Um, so sometimes if it's a very minor change, um, just you know, slight equipment changes or something, those could be um, mentioned just as footnotes. But major changes or changes to exclusion criteria or procedures um, are handled sort of at, at editorial discretion. Reach out to the editor, say this change is happening, um, and they use editorial discretion to decide if that's a game changer, if that requires additional review and input, that's very likely to happen, or just a note that that's fine, go ahead with that, that won't, um, that won't affect final publishability. Are registry reports suitable for all research? No, it's not suitable for every type of research that's conducted. It's applicable to field where hypothesis-driven research um, and where there is hypothesis driven research um, and where one or more of the following things are likely to occur. If there's publication bias, if there's a, 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 um, a strong desire to get statistically significant findings, if it could suffer from hindsight bias or low statistical power, or if there's a lack of replication within the field, those are all reasons to um, implement registry reports within a particular discipline. Um, but it's not applicable for all modes of research that answer different types of research questions. Again, exploratory work, methods development, model or theory development um, don't necessarily benefit from this research workflow. Some of my analyses will depend on the results of what I see early on. How can I pre-register each step? Well, the important thing there is to pre-register the decision tree. Um, knowing that that's going to happen, one or two or three steps down the line could be feasible to um, make sure that, that those decisions are made in a way that aren't biased by how the data are looking coming in. Um, and in some cases, pilot data or sort of modeled expectations can be used to sort of justify some of those decisions early on without being biased to the incoming data that will be used to draw inferences. Can I submit a registered report if I'm using an existing data set? It depends. Some journals offer secondary registry reports. Um, if you've put in safeguards to ensure that bias is being prevented, the authors would have to provide a very precise statement saying the degree to which they are ignorant of that data set. Um, and so that's on a case by case basis with the journal. Um, oh, and then finally here, um, we've known a lot about these problems with hindsight bias and um, looking to confirm previously held notions for a long time and sort of built into the fabric of the way that science produces. And so um, a lot of these ideas have been um, pushed around before that we can now have a, a, a really clear process for addressing them. So with that, I will say thank you. Um, we're going to switch to Star Fula. And again, these presentation materials will be made available. Um, and if you'd like to follow that link now, you can take a screenshot and start looking at it. But now I'm David, gonna... this is this David, this is Jason. I'm just gonna jump in because I noticed the question in the QA. But and you can decide to defer this until the end. Mm -hmm. um, the question is because uh, register reports show a sharp increase in null findings, are scientists more cautious to use them? Um, that's a great question. The um, the when presented with, with null findings, um, authors traditionally don't, don't quite know what to do with them. Um, it's it's it inferred, it's, the impression is given that the study failed um, and that the work is not gonna be interesting and not gonna be publishable. So that's a problem because 
null results can, if, they're, if the study was well designed and well conducted, be as meaningful as positive results. Um, and right now there's a strong bias against those null results. And so we have a biased understanding of how the universe works because we're only seeing half the picture. Um, that's a problem that authors and researchers address. That's a problem that um, editors and reviewers see. You know, null findings don't seem interesting no matter how credible they are. And so um, the desire for the format is to make sure that research questions that are interesting regardless of outcome and that are conducted to a high degree of rigor, that that information is disseminated. Um, and it's a responsibility of the entire research community to make sure to showcase these null findings as true, accurate, credible. Um, and since they were asked before seeing the results, there was a reason to ask that question. Um, and just because they're null results doesn't mean that they're not necessarily interesting. So the time to judge whether or not a null result is meaningful is before you see the null result. Um, otherwise, it'll just bias how we perceive the universe. I'll mark that as answered, but we can come back to it. Um, and Stev Rula could probably um, give some insight into that based on what they've seen so far at Nature. Great, thank you, David. Um, it's a pleasure to have the, the chance to talk about our experience with registered reports uh, from Earth Nature Behavior. Um, to, oh, sorry, my screen is getting fancy. Right. So, um, in this presentation, over the next 20 to 25 minutes, I'll talk a little bit about nature human behavior and why we adopted the report format. I'll walk you through our requirements for registered reports in the journal. As David uh, pointed out, there is some variability um, in, in terms of what sorts of research different journals can consider and what expectations they have for the format. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our evaluation criteria uh, in the two different stages of consideration between probable submission and stage two submission. Um, that are specific to major human behavior as well as dimensions that can vary and apply across all journals. Um, there are three things that I want to make sure that by the time the, this presentation is over is entirely clear to everybody listening in, is that registered reports represent a radically different way of doing research for authors, one that I strongly believe leads to much more robust, credible science, and so a radically different approach to peer review for reviewers that is far more satisfying and gives them much greater involvement in the work. Finally, um, David mentioned uh, a list of advantages that the scientific community um, perceives uh, being conferred to science and scientists and the community in general. So I won't go through those. I will just focus on the single uh, key benefit that I see for funders and why funders would be making a very, very clever investment if they adopted and supported initiatives that promote uh, registered reports. So um, Nature and Human Behavior is a nature research journal published by Springer Nature. Uh, the flagship journal of our group is Nature, and there are now 29 primary research nature branded journals, including Nature Medicine, Nature Genetics, Nature Neuroscience. Nature Human Behavior is a recent addition. Um, we launched um, at the beginning of uh, 2017, and that's the time when we adopted registered reports at launch. We're an online only journal that currently supports green open access following an embargo of six months for a subscription to this journal. And like all of the nature journals, um, the, we operate through professional, we're all professional editors. It's a small team of professional editors, currently in three locations. 
and were very actively involved in the peer review process. There are three aspects of the journal that are very relevant to what I'll be talking about uh, for the rest, in the rest of this presentation. But this is a very broad school journal covering several different disciplines. We're highly selective in terms of the types of research uh, that we aim to publish. And one of the priorities when launching the journal is to design its policies in a way that support robust and diagnostics. So the journal is a thematic journal. We're very used to disciplinary journals. So journals, as I mentioned before, in nature, um, neuroscience, journals that are devoted to just this discipline. We are um, a thematic journal that actually encourages the submission of research from across all the science, social, biological, uh, health, physical, that have something important, significant to say about any aspect of individual or collective human behavior. Um, we ultimately aim to strengthen the reach and the impact of this research in addressing the most pressing societal challenges, ranging from health to sustainability. And as I said, a priority for us is to support robust scientific practices. Usually, when you talk about a journal that's highly selective and um, that wants to support scientific practices, the past decades, that has been somewhat of an oxymoron. However, it just it doesn't have to be. Um, and the, the way we've approached um, our policies and our evaluation criteria, publication criteria are designed in order to align what is good for science with what is good for scientists, publishing papers that may be highly visible um, to the one or several communities that may be interested in them. One example of how we support robust reproducible research is through our evaluation criteria. Yes? Fabriola, I'm sorry to bother. Um, there's a little bit of audio, just time to have an echo. It sounds like a big room. Could you speak a little bit closer to the microphone? Of course. Is this better? Brilliant. I think so. So um, I've put on this slide um, our editorial evaluation criteria for all the research manuscripts that are submitted to the journal, just registered reports. This is for any research. There are certain editorial criteria that we've put in place in order to promote research that is credible, robust, and reproducible. We prioritize for peer review research that has been pre-registered. We do not mandate that, but a piece of research that has pre-registered its um, hypothesis and analysis plan, its protocol, will be prioritized for peer review. We don't look just at significance on whether a result is significant or not, because we know that significance is meaningless unless a study is sufficiently powered, and unless effect sizes are meaningful. Uh, we've also redefined what we consider a significant scientific advance. Discovery is extremely important. Science would come to a halt if we stopped learning new things and discovering new things. But that's only half of the story. The other half of the story is making sure that what we think we know is true, and how much faith, how much um, we can believe a specific finding or discovery and so on. So traditionally for highly selective journals, there may have been an outsized focus on discovery and on novelty. We believe that that's unwarranted. And for that reason, we prioritize equally for peer review and publication studies that may say nothing, absolutely nothing new but they represent an advance in evidence. For instance, a replication study that replicates, successfully or not, a highly influential previously published paper, or a study that due to its scale and rigor can provide a definitive, either confirmatory or discon disconfirmatory answer to a research question. We've published um, 
a number of papers that are evidence advances rather than saying discoveries or adding something new to the literature. These are extremely important. So we've tried to, I'm sorry, my, my PowerPoint isn't cooperating. Let me just give it one minute. Um, but to bridge to the following slide, we have tried to align our editorial criteria with what we believe is good for science. So providing the right incentives for uh, scientists to do um, in, in, throughout the publication process. Um, just give me a minute. Um, there we go. Sorry, it's being a little bit obstinate today. Um, so we've redefined what constitutes a significant scientific advance and we've designed our editorial criteria to provide that alignment. And we've gone a step further to adopt the attitude that David started his presentation with. We firmly believe that if the question is important and the methods are robust, the answer will be important no matter what it is. And that's the reason why we published and we have published studies reporting in our findings. And it's a key reason why we have adopted registered reports. More broadly, registered reports for us represent a key way of addressing issues, both of questionable research practices, but also publication bias. Um, you may have already heard that or read that, but um, in 1979, Rosenthal, in an article, he, he coined the, the file drawer problem, the term the file drawer problem. So to his mind, the worst case scenario, um, which he could imagine as potentially being true, is that journals are filled with the 5% of studies that represent a type 1 error, while the 95% of studies are in the file drawer and non-significant. We know that this extreme case is not true. But we also know that publication bias is a huge problem. Upwards of 80%, uh, according to an article by Daniele Fanelli a few years ago, upwards of 80% of research published across the sciences reports significant positive results in support of the hypothesis tested. And we know that that's not, that is definitely not what the full spectrum of results <laughs> adding what's in the file drawer represents. So we, we strongly believe that we must shift the focus to the questions and the methods. The answer will be important if the question is important and you have the best possible methods to address it. So as David explained, um, the registered report format is not, is not suitable for every type of research. It's suitable for confirmatory research, for research that aims to test hypotheses, that is driven by earlier research or and theoretical theorizing. It's not suitable for exploratory research, which is extremely important. We do not emphasize it. We, we very much welcome it. But the issues that the format aims to address are limited to how we conduct confirmatory research rather than exploratory research. Currently, uh, we only consider registered reports that intend to collect data, so the data doesn't exist. But we are considering, uh, we are working on revising our policies to extend uh, the types of um, research and data we consider to secondary data as well as meta-analyses. A key concern with registered reports is that they limit creativity, they limit um, being able to follow up a serendipitous finding that you didn't expect and changes entirely how you theorize and hypothesize about a phenomenon. To address this, we allow incremental registration. If after, in principle, acceptance, the authors go off and do their study and they come up with a result they didn't expect and it it changes entirely their thinking about the, the question they're pursuing, they can submit an incremental register, second registration, which we will do um, 
everything we can to fast track through peer review and then they can go off and do the additional work and have a mean, meaningful project. Currently, we also require that authors at the time of stage one submission have already received ethical approval for their research project and funding. However, uh, we are very keen in actually starting to collaborate with funders and adopting the option, option one in, in David's uh, presentation to work on initiatives that merge uh, grant and, uh, and peer review. More on that a little bit later, but you also have a third webinar to look forward to on that topic. Also, um, at the time of uh, submission of their stage one uh, protocol, and again, if it is accepted in principle, authors must agree to deposit it um, in a repository so that it's a matter of public record. It's not just hidden within a journal. Uh, it will be accessible publicly either at the time uh, that it is deposited if the authors have a problem with that or under embargo until the stage two paper is submitted. We also mandate uh, open uh, data, open code and open materials. We will consider and discuss cases where um, there are uh, privacy uh, or other ethical concerns that prevent open um, sharing. Nonetheless, in those cases, we will negotiate solutions that allow access, even though sharing may not be public. Now, um, we, as I said, launched in January 2017. We're a new journal, and registered reports are a relatively new format. We have received to date 80 stage one um, registered reports, 80. That represents a small fraction um, of the research articles submitted to us. However, we saw that going from one to two, there has been a steady increase in the number of articles of, of stage one um, protocols submitted to us, as well as that questions from the community. So researchers whose interest in the format, who have become aware of the format and would like to know more about how to go about submitting a proposal. Although at the beginning we received mostly submissions from psychology and neuroscience, now we receive a broader spectrum of, um, of protocols, both from the uh, biological sciences, for instance, genetics, and the social sciences, for instance, economics and political science. Um, David walked you through um, the core criteria of evaluation of stage one and stage two submissions. Um, I won't add much to that except to say that these evaluation criteria can be tailored to different journals. Registered reports are suitable for non-selective journals for scientific advance, so for journals that will publish all research that is robust regardless of whether the question is important, uh, to highly selective journals where um, there are criteria uh, in terms of scientific advance, in terms of broad relevance, in terms of impact to more than one discipline. We are in that end of the spectrum and we have modified our evaluation criteria to fit um, the, um, the aims of the journal. So we ask for research that our stage one submissions must be relevant must ask an important question, but also be relevant for a broad multidisciplinary audience. We are also looking for substantial projects that can provide a comprehensive answer to a research question rather than preliminary evidence. For that reason, we've added an additional criterion that other journals don't have. Um, we also aim for a higher level of evidence than is usually required. So um, the majority of journals that have adopted the format require that power for frequentist statistics is 80%. We ask for 95 percent 
other journals that um, looked at these factor of sales. We've upped the requirements, so we ask for, for more evidence. Journals can adjust the criteria um, according to their selectivity or no selectivity beyond robustness. One principle that is in common across all the journals that have adopted the format is that we all believe that everything methodologically, research design, conceptual hypothesis, predictions, and analysis plan must be in place and a decision for acceptance must be made in principle before the data has been collected or accessed. So we all agree to do acceptance blindly, results blind. At Nature Human Behavior, um, the outcome for, for a stage one uh, submissions may be either to reject a paper or to request a revision. Usually, um, stage one submissions of the journal are rejected either editorially or after a peer review because the research question does not meet our criteria of significance or because the question may be important but of interest to a specialist audience. Because the study of studies cannot address the research question and because the project is exploratory and hence the format is, is simply not suitable. When we ask for, for a revision, when we invite a revision, usually the authors um, have to address virtually the majority of the points that are put down. So the proposals, protocols, you can't imagine how much nurturing happens during the peer review of stage one registered reports. The work comes out not virtually unrecognizable because it's the research question that the authors want to address, but the design is optimized, the analysis pipeline is optimized, hypotheses become clearer, they're linked to specific predictions. Um, the authors take to heart issues of robustness and positive controls and the need to properly specify their samples depending what they're design is. So the peer review process transforms stage one submissions. Usually um, submissions go through two to three rounds of review before they receive acceptance in principle. Um, and our reviewers um, consist of subject matter experts statistics so the panel of reviewers for every submission will involve expertise covering these three areas as uh, david mentioned the authors go off they do their research so we accept it in principle they deposit the protocol go off do their research write the whole thing up come to us for an evaluation we as editors take a look at whether the authors did what they said uh, they would do and whether the introduction the rationale and the hypothesis are the same as the ones we approved they have to be verbatim for except minor changes in intense the first part of the paper must be what we accepted now if all is good we send the paper out to review if we notice that there are deviations then we discuss the possibility of rejection following examination of what what deviations happened why and so on we may consult with reviewers we may not depending on exactly how the project and the, the our reviewers at that point only check whether the authors did what they said they would do, whether there are controls and um, quality checks. They all worked as intended. That is, that the research is valid, that it does test what they, the authors intended to test. They did what they said. They haven't changed anything. They have clearly distinguished um, their pre-registered analysis from any exploratory analysis. They check whether the exploratory analysis makes sense and whether the conclusions are meaningful and they're based, they're justified given what the authors found. As David mentioned, um, it's, it's hard for reviewers to hold back 
and not to say, not to say, oh, do this additional exploratory analysis to try and, and, and dig down to the reason why the outcome is null or why it's negative, even though it was hypothesized to be positive. Authors are not obligated to do any of those. Uh, they are obligated to only report what they said they would and any other analysis that is necessary to support their conclusions. But we overrule reviewer requests that may, take, they may require any, any set of additional analysis or they may raise um, novelty or any other concerns or concerns about the interpretability of the results. All these do not enter at this stage. So, assuming that a stage one protocol is strictly adhered to, if the authors did what they said they would do, then their positive controls and quality checks confirm that the study is valid, and their pre-registered analyses were all performed the way the authors said they would. They're distinct from exploratory analysis, and their conclusions make sense, then we accept uh, the registered, the stage two submission. Actually, we're only now at the point where we are accepting our first two uh, registered reports. And both of these papers, it will take a few weeks to encapsulate this philosophy. I'm afraid I can't say for reasons of confidentiality at this stage anything more because the papers are not in the public domain yet. Uh, however, very soon you will be able to see in print examples of, of um, what I've been talking about. So, registered reports represent a radically different approach to research for authors. Usually, the, the mainstream approach now is you have a rather vague idea of high, theory A, theory B, some contrasting hypothesis. You go off, you do an experiment, getting more or less the number of subjects that other previous studies um, did. You, data peak, you analyze your data at a number of points to see are the results significant. Um, if they're significant, you stop testing. If they're not, you scrap the study, you go back and try again. So this is, this is not, um, these approaches for a very long time, and still is, it, it is the case. It was unclear to the research community, and it may still be unclear, unclear to many researchers, that all these practices invalidate the way, invalidate the research. Simply, you cannot, the results are no longer credible with the standard approaches that were not consciously and are not consciously uh, necessarily adopted, but they do render the results of research simply fiction. So researchers need to change the frame, frame of mind and it's something that they love to do actually. Um, it's uh, our experience with authors is that they genuinely appreciate the process um, that the registered report format takes them through. Um, they focus much more on rigor of design rather than stressing whether the results will be significant or not. Um, they um, focus more on issues of, of power and positive controls and interpretability of the research than they do on what comes at the end. It's also a very different approach to peer review for reviewers. Um, it's a much more collaborative process. So I think it's, reviewing can be a thankless task, especially for, for full length manuscripts. You get a paper as a reviewer and you accept to review it because you read the abstract and you loved the question and you want to read more about the paper. But as you read on, you find that, oh, this is flawed and mm, this should have been done differently. And, the research doesn't quite answer the question that the authors posed, and oops, that's a major, major flaw, and the study is invalid. So all you need to do is to provide some critical feedback after the fact. For registered reports, reviewers have a much more active role in shaping research project, and their feedback has a central role in actually making a protocol as good as it can be given the shortcomings of the peer review process itself. That could be a matter for a di totally different uh, series of webinars, but to the best of the abilities of a peer review, 
peer review process, you get the drawings before the project starts collecting data or analyzing data. So reviewers shape the project and it's something that actually they enjoy more. At least the, the feedback we're getting um, from our reviewers as such. Um, author, uh, reviewers also need to change the frame of mind in terms of how, how much foresight they need to have absent the results what needs to change in the design of the overseas literature and other research it's, it's, um, it's as well designed and in as good a place as possible before being executed. Um, a tough aspect is refraining at stage two submission as I said from recommending exploratory analyses that could take the research in any number of suggestions or commenting on how informative, um, on whether the results are informative, assuming that all, all the controls um, um, demonstrated the validity of the study or not. So it's difficult to move a little bit away from uh, focusing on, on the results rather than on how the, the question and the process that got there. However, this is something that uh, we see all, re all reviewers very, uh, the reviewers who, the self-selected sample that agreed to review for us, that are actually very willing to work on this and enjoy the process of uh, learning how to peer review uh, registered reports. Now, the benefits, I, I strongly believe there are substantial benefits um, to adopting and supporting registered reports on the behalf of journals, scientists, research communities collectively, and funders. And for funders, you have limited funds and you want, you want your funds to actually offer you the maximum return for your investment. You want to um, provide a grant that will actually um, at the end of it, gave an answer to what the grant was designed to address. In the standard publication model, peer review happens too late. So uh, what we see, and it's, um, it's a difficult process as editors, is that a, a substantial proportion of the manuscripts that we reject after peer review is because of fundamental flaws. Fundamental flaws that if the peer review had happened earlier, it would have been avoided. This means thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, euros, pounds, or whatever currency wasted in a project that perhaps even after two or three years of investment from the researchers, turns out to be fundamentally flawed. With a registered reports model, peer review happens when you can make the most difference in research resource investment. It can make a difference when the researchers are conceptualizing, de designing, and making methodological and analytical decisions. So all these aspects can be corrected, identified and corrected before um, going off and collecting data. So if as funders in 2019, you make it uh, you make a single decision to support one initiative, I'd say there's very, very good reason to make that registered reports. You, you get maximum return on investment. As I said, we're very interested in, in partnering with funders, um, either on a combined um, grant and uh, peer review process, or in promoting initiatives around um, registered reports and, and pre-registration. So please do feel free uh, to follow up with me. Um, I've provided my details here. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Severo, for giving that insight and perspective of, of how nature human behavior sees this um, moving forward. And I, and I wholeheartedly agree with that ending note that if you can do one thing this year, um, engaging with that register report format would be the way to go. Um, we'll leave it open for a few more mom for minutes if there are questions. Can we give a brief teaser for what 
the third in the series might cover. Yes, Mirrors, thanks for asking. So that's going to cover the, there have been about, uh, about five partnerships that I'm aware of where a uh, research funder and a journal has partnered to, to decide jointly whether or not the work um, should be granted funds um, and granted an in-principle acceptance by the journal. Um, and so we'll be giving a, a, a overview of that workflow, the additional benefits to, to efficiency that the, that workflow provides, um, and a couple of examples uh, from um, both the granting agency's perspectives and the journal perspective of what they've seen out of the process so far. Um, and we've also seen some preliminary um, evidence on the effects of those types of partnerships as well. So we'll um, be sharing what we see from that. Expect that in um, uh, later in April or May. What journal or agency, if possible to mention? Um, the, if you go to the Richter Reports website, cos.io slash rr, and I'll share my screen and get you there right now. Right, let me share my screen. Let's show you how to find that information. So this is the Registered Reports website, cos.io slash rr. And here are a couple of links to a few existing ones. And as more are announced, we'll put links to them. But Cancer Research UK, um, has worked with the journal Nicotine and Tobacco Research. The Children's Tumor Foundation is working with PLOS One. Um, and we've seen a couple, I think they're in their second round. We've seen three studies from that project um, get funded. And wait for that to pop up. Um, and their registry is here on the OSF. You can see the currently funded projects there. And I believe their second round is underway right now. Um, they have a call for that on the Children's Tumor Foundation website. Um, but these are partnerships between the journal and the funding agency, Children's Tumor Foundation. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you, Jason and Sarah Varula for your time and help getting this off the ground. Um, and we will follow up with resources from this, web from this webinar. Thank you everyone. Thank you, pleasure.